When it comes to liquid cooling, the answer is always, why yes, of course. Nothing quite matches the cooling capabilities of those light, fizzy bubbles from the homebrewed Oktoberfest on a hot summer's... Oh wait, we're talking about CPU cooling today. <laughs> I got a little carried away. Hey there, and welcome back to Machines and More. Well, it's summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, and it seems like we can't get enough cooling lately. I think few would argue against the cooling capacity of beer, but I'm just slightly concerned about the microbial growth uh, for use in a custom loop. Uh, fortunately, today we're talking about closed loop cooling, and especially closed loops in the Cooler Master NR200. So you won't have to worry about supplying your own coolant. We just got done with looking at air cooling thermals. And if you recall, the optimal arrangement was two case fans exhausting out the top with the U12A's not to an NFA12 fans pointed towards the IO end of the case to exhaust out the rear. Now, before we jump into the testing, I just wanted to show those of you that were curious. Uh, with a 30 millimeter thick radiator and 25 millimeter thick fans, you can fit an HDD on the PSU shroud. There might be a negative effect on thermals due to the impeded airflow, but it fits. Now, originally I was going to discuss NR200 liquid AIO cooling and do a wrap up of air cooling versus water cooling in one video. However, as it turns out, there is a lot of information to present and as such, I'm still doing a final round of uh, roundup of air coolers, including the Saif Fuma 2. Um, so I'll stop short of making an analysis of air versus liquid cooling, at least for this case. And today I'll represent the data from the U12A in a comparison. I did want to get the data out as soon as it was complete. So I'll be doing that final air versus liquid cooling summary and recommendation shortly. Fundamentally speaking, water cooling is just a more active form of air cooling. Now, air cooling takes advantage of usually liquid-filled heat pipes, which act as a passive medium to transfer heat to a heat sink, which has fans mounted to it in, in order to exchange heat with the surrounding cooler air um, as it passes through the heat fins. A liquid cooling utilizes a pump actively recirculating coolant to transfer the heat to the radiator which also has fans mounted to it for heat exchange. So even though it's water-based cooling, how fans are mounted, how many fans are mounted, and the particular idiosyncrasies of the case it's being used in will have a big impact on performance. Typically speaking, the pump design and power has a lot less thermal impact than the radiator design. Liquid doesn't have to move at a rapid rate in order for effective cooling to occur. And even if you could move liquid in your system at a million miles an hour, you'd just be re recirculating hot coolant, unless your radiator has the thermal potential to exchange off that heat. Uh, many AIOs on the market with a pump in the CPU block are all Acetec pumps. So whether you buy a Corsair or an NZXT Kraken or an EVGA, the pumps are all very similar. And uh, so the more surface area that is available for heat exchange, in your radiator will will make be the difference uh, in, in how effective your cooling is and that's also contingent on your fans being able to effectively pass air through those heat fins now a pretty popular and excellent all-in-one cooler is the nzxt kraken line of coolers so today i'll be testing with the x52 which takes 120 millimeter fans two of them just like our u12a does now, I am aware that there's a newer X53 model, but if you don't care too much about lighting effects or a newer pump design, there are a few tangible benefits of the older model over the newer one. And by the way, the lighting effects don't really matter at all in this case, right? Because the radiator is blocking the pump head behind this mesh panel. The X52 actually has better RAM clearance, which is very helpful on a mini ITX board within an SFF case. It also has an onboard fan controller, which as you'll see, is really handy for the thermal testing. Now, during the days that my AIO testing was done, Gamers Nexus actually released a video highlighting 
some of the downsides of bottom mounted AIO radiators. Now, while I don't know the actual impact on pump life from trapped air pockets, I generally agree with Steve's observations, and I also modified my testing schedule by skipping bottom mount radiator testing in order to better focus on how to get the absolute best performance of whatever AIO you're using. And so that's why this video will be a multi-part series. In addition, I think many of you will be reconsidering vertically mounting your GPU in order to bottom mount the radiator. Um, the non-tempered glass version of the case only comes with a mesh side panel, which is actually the better way to mount the radiator in here. So side panel mount is how we'll be testing it. And for those of you without riser cables, it will also save you a little bit of cash. AIOs mount up pretty easily in the NR200. Simply mount the pump head to the motherboard mounts according to the manufacturer's directions, and then mount the radiator to the side panel. Uh, you can then mount fans to it based on the configuration you choose, either exhausting the hot air outside or intaking cooler air from outside. Now, today I'll discuss when you might choose either configuration. I won't rehash my testing philosophy as we'll be using the same blender render as in our air cooling testing in order to give a consistent thermal load. And also the same two fans in our two case fan air cooling testing. Now, one is a stock Cooler Master Sickle Flow and the other is the Noctua NFF12. So there are a few pointers to note here since we are testing with liquid cooling. Uh, so feel free to check out the air cooling test for a little more detail on the testing methodology. But real quick, I'll highlight the differences uh, for this test as follows. First off, since liquid and coolant has a higher specific heat than air, it takes longer for water coolers to hit thermal equilibrium. In my air cooling test, I was taking the final five minutes of the CPU thermals, but the reality is that temperatures were stable almost a few minutes in, and those temperatures stayed stable throughout the remaining time. So averaging the last minute of temperatures would have been materially the same as averaging the last five minutes like we did uh, for the air cooling test. For AIO testing, I did a few preliminary renders in this setup, and I observed the liquid temperature in NZXT's CAM software, and also the CPU temperatures. Based on how long it took the liquid temperature and CPU temperatures to stabilize, I landed on taking the thermal data from the last 100 seconds of the render. For the period in between tests for the air cooling, I did a minimum of five minutes idle time, you might recall. Uh, but for liquid cooling, I based it off of the CPU temperatures returning back to idle. And also critically, I did not retest until the liquid temperature also returned to the same temperature as the start of testing. Now this took at least about 15 minutes. In all testing, the started liquid temperature uh, was 32 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, that same classroom render 2.82 was used and along with the Unigen Heaven 4.0 for the advanced GPU included tests. Again, I'm testing with the Ryzen 3700X here on a Gigabyte X570 Aorus ITX motherboard. And since I wanted to maximize thermal differences for comparison against air cooling, I only did overclocked tests here. Lastly, since we already did thermal testing and had that baseline for noise performance, I decided to match that by locking the fans to the PWM setting, which was around 67%. Um, that, that yielded a similar noise level of around 46.7 dBA. Matching the noise levels lets us get a more telling temperature comparison against air cooling and other configurations. For the test, including the GPU, I locked fans at 67% PWM and the GPU fans at 75%, also to get a higher resolution comparison. And this yielded a consistent 50 dBA. So let's jump right into the data. First off, the 3700X was clocked to 4.3 gigahertz at 1.25 volts. Now I wouldn't take too much stock in the actual details of the noise levels because the radiator fans were locked the same speed and all the case fans spun at around 1200 RPM. For, so for all intents and purposes, and to my ears, the sound levels were all the same. Now the best performing combination is the radiator fans as an intake, coupled with the case fans as an exhaust. 
We already knew from air cooling that top fans as exhaust would be an optimal scenario. So I was curious if that assertion would carry over here as well, given that the direction of airflow is on a different axis. Uh, but it certainly makes sense that the two top uh, exhaust configurations are the best. I think most of you would agree that the optimal airflow direction makes sense here too, right? Because intaking from the side gives the coolest air to the radiator. And it would also make sense for these case fans at the top to immediately exhaust that hot expelled air out. It's very refreshing to see that the data supports that assertion. And wow, uh, the worst configuration, radiator fans as an intake and the top fans as an intake is pretty obviously the worst one coming in at almost three degrees worse than the best configuration. Now, I must admit, I'm a bit surprised that the exhaust and exhaust configuration performed this well, given that usual uh, logical common sense dictates, in a case, airflow should optimally flow in one direction. Uh, at least it shouldn't be fighting each other, right? Checking in against our best uh, U12A configuration, the X52 is neck and neck. With noise normalization uh, to match the U12A, you can see just how close the raw CPU thermals are. And since in our air cooling test, only the best exhaust and exhaust combo allowed the 3700X to run at 4.3 gigahertz while running Unigen Heaven, I also ran the same speculative test. I, I didn't present the thermal and noise data previously since there was nothing to compare it to. All the other air cooling configurations failed that test. Now, similarly, all uh, water cooling configurations failed that test, except for one. And the only one to succeed was the radiator intake and the case fans exhausting combination. So let's take a look how air is doing uh, against water here. In the super stress test scenario, it's hard to say if the U12A is better or the X52. Uh, the X52, it may have better CPU thermals, but it has an advantage in uh, GPU thermals. And this is because the intaking radiator is giving the GPU a cloud of hot exhausted air to work in. While the, when the U12A is as an exhaust, it's helping that GPU air, uh, by pushing hot air through its radiator. And that's what open air tests don't show you. There is a significant trade-off in closed spaces and especially in small form factor cases you will sometimes have to choose this GPU or, or the, over the CPU or vice versa. And it really depends on your individual use cases. Nonetheless, it was great that both of these ideal CPU thermal scenarios completed the extreme overclock test. As you recall in the air cooling test we did uh, for the CPU only tests, uh, we used that slightly higher clock of 4.3 gigahertz, and then we threw in a GPU intensive benchmark uh, to simulate the worst load possible in a case, uh, down clocking the CPU to 4.2 gigahertz. Now this allows us to see how the GPU's airflow properties interact with the radiator's airflow uh, with both running at the same time. And, and here I ranked CPU thermal from best to worst. As you can see from the chart, the most acceptable configuration if you prioritize CPU thermals is also the radiator fans acting as that intake with the top case fans as the exhaust. Now the C CPU thermals are best by a hugely significant margin. Now GPU thermals aren't that great, but they're certainly not the worst. Here it's not immediately obvious which configuration is best, but at a minimum we can safely rule out one option that is clearly the worst. The intake and intake is pretty terrible and for a good reason. If we take configuration number one as our baseline, in the intake and intake scenario, we have three and a half degrees worse CPU thermals and a whopping five and a half degrees worse for the GPU. And let's not forget the intake intake was also the worst for CPU only as well. So in this orientation, the case fans are fighting the intake airflow from the radiator and at the same time forcing hot radiator air into the GPU's path. So we can safely rule out this one for good. At the same time, we can't rule out any other configurations just yet. So I tweaked the fan curves within the noise target of 50 decibels in order to get more resolution in this comparison. Uh, since configuration number one, which was the intake and exhaust, since it gave such good CPU thermals, 
I felt comfortable dropping the, uh, the PWM levels for the radiator fans to lower levels and taking that GPU fan to higher levels, uh, all while staying at 50 decibels. And since the GPU performed so well for the radiator exhaust and case fan exhaust option, I dropped the fan speed on the GPU in order to give us some noise room uh, in order to boost the radiator fan. So I was able to increase the radiator fan's PWM speed to 75% and still hit 50 decibels. Now comparing the three remaining configurations with some additional radiator fan and GPU fan 50 decibel combos, now we get a little more detail. These here are all sorted by CPU temps. Uh, there is no one clear winner if you weigh both CPU temps and GPU temps, but there is a pretty clear trade-off trend that's developing here. At the top of the spectrum, the radiator fans as intake and top case fans as an exhaust option, that's going to give you the best CPU thermals. And since the GPU's operation has little impact on the radiator fans pulling in air from the outside, it works best if your priority is CPU thermal. It performs acceptably well when you trade off some of those CPU thermals for slightly better GPU thermals as well. Now on the other end of the spectrum, if you prioritize GPU thermals, that exhaust and exhaust combination gives the best GPU thermals, albeit with the worst CPU thermals. The reason that the CPU thermals are the worst while the GPU is the coolest is that the exhausting case fans at the top are pulling that hot GPU air into the path of the radiator fans, which then run that warmer air through that radiator, resulting in less cooling performance from the radiator. At the same time, because there's so much upwards airflow directing the GPU exhaust away from the GPU, the GPU can then perform at its best because the exhausting radiator and these top uh, case fans are helping cooler to be drawn through the bottom and through the back. So uh, you might ask, what is the optimal fan configuration out of the three remaining viable ones? Well, the configuration that I will stop short of recommending is the radiator fans as an exhaust and the top fans as an intake. And you might ask why, since it at least performed well enough in the balanced GPU and CPU prioritization spectrum, right? But here's the logic. Configuration number one with the radiator fans as an intake and the case fans as an exhaust, that was only slightly, slightly worse uh, when we looked at the middle of the uh, priority spectrum. But there is a very functional reason you might not run it this way. Um, if you put your computer on a desktop or close to your person, this is actually a really uncomfortable configuration to run because there is so much hot air being forced out of the side panel. And this was only exacerbated by the intaking case fans, right? The panel wasn't facing me directly, but I could still feel the hot air at this uh, face level and it was not comfortable. Now, if you have your case farther away, it might be okay. Uh, many people also recommend that the top fans should always point in an exhaust direction, in the direction that hot air should go anyway. Now, I'm not of the opinion that this is as important because we're talking about air that's being forced and moved around by fans, but it is still a consideration to take into account. But since there's an alternative available that's reasonable, I just don't think there's much of a reason to run it this way, unless somehow your use cases are evenly split between CPU and GPU tasks. And it doesn't allow much for much of an emphasis on the CPU or the GPU either. So with that one out, that leaves two remaining configurations that are viable. If you run a hot CPU like a 10900K or you have an overclock 10700K or a 10600K or you run a 3700X and above on the Ryzen spectrum or you do a lot of CPU heavy tasks like video editing, code compiling or you plan on overclocking to the max, Radiator intake and top exhaust provides the most headroom for CPU thermal. No other configuration comes close. If your main priority is gaming, you might be running something like a Ryzen 5 3600 or a 10600K where CPU performance is less critical since the GPU will be running at 100% uh, a lot more. Uh, in many gaming scenarios, and especially at higher gaming resolutions, that CPU will be just humming along at a lower utilization rate. So CPU thermals aren't a big priority. In that situation, you would be best served running the radiator as an exhaust and the top fans as an exhaust. 
Now, surprisingly, this works well because the case is well ventilated enough that the pressure can equalize quickly. So more air in the, will be drawn in from the back and the bottom panels in order to compensate for the air leaving. Now, I will caution that if your GPU is a hot one, like a 5700 XT or a 2070 Super and above, the penalty on your CPU will be greater and greater. Although, again, in gaming scenarios, this won't necessarily be a big issue uh, for the CPU. Now, the reason I tested a more average GPU here was that many of you might be running this uh, the same 1660 Super in this case, and this is to capture more of the average user set. As I was playing around with the fan levels with the exhausting radiator uh, configuration, I couldn't get anywhere near the best CPU temperatures, even when I ran those fans at 100%. And likewise, with GPU fans running at 100%, in the radiator intake and case exhaust option, I couldn't get anywhere near the best thermals like what the radiator exhaust and case fans exhaust gave. Next up, I'm gonna take things to the absolute max with the X52, and I'm also going to do a final air cooling roundup, including this side Fuma 2 air cooler, and then do a final summary of air versus liquid cooling solutions in the NR200. Well, all this talk of heat and thermals is getting me to TJ Maxx. So I hope you don't mind if I sign off and go grab some of my personalized liquid cooling solution. So stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see all of you again soon.